All right, so we're up and running. All right, well, good afternoon and welcome. Um, and so, so I mentioned in, in 224 how few classes we have left, and it's even fewer for this class. Um, so after today, we have four more class meetings, and that's it. We meet on Monday, and then Wednesday is a holiday, Friday is a holiday, and then we meet three days the last week. So we've got this class today, and then we have four more meetings, and then we're done with discrete structures. So that's been surprisingly fast to me, but it's good stuff. So let me begin by talking about homework seven, and the homework that um that I just graded. And homework seven seemed fine um, for most people. It seems like um, we're understanding product rule, sum rule, permutations, combinations. A few cases where there's some confusion about you know is this ordered or unordered. And I don't think there's there's a particularly um, foolproof way to just look at a problem and know if it's ordered or unordered. Ordered. You have to kind of like be able to to think about it in terms of of maybe um, you know performing a series of tasks and does the order in which those tasks happen affect the outcome or not? Um, and so so. Um, but other than that, it seemed pretty good. Um, a reminder, I'll, I'll ask people again, if, if you're doing a problem and you know that the solution is something like, you know, um, P15, comma, 5, number of, of ordered permutations or arrangements of five objects taken from 15, um, I really want you to, when you're writing down your solution or doing your work, make sure you put that down. So that I can clearly see, oh, this person knows that this is a permutation. They're doing five things out of 15. Great. And then, you know, you can do this. If you like, and you can do this. And you can do this. And you can do this, and so on and so forth. Right? But, but this is sort of the most important part of the whole thing. Right? That tells me, you know... Which um, which principle of counting we're using here? It's a permutation. You know what the the number of things are and the size of the universe and so on. And then you know maybe getting this down here shows me. Oh yeah, and you also know the formula. And then the rest of this, I'm not really worried about. It's nice, you know, you want to get it down to an answer, and I can look at the answer and see if it's correct. But this is this is the most important part in the beginning, which makes it you know different from some other subjects where all we care about is the answer. Here, I really care about how did you get there. So, just for my own clarity, mm -hmm. permutation is an ordered list, right? Mm -hmm. So you would use that if, if the order matters. So if you're doing like A, B, C, and then A, C, you know, A, C, B is a different mm -hmm. combination. Then it's ordered. Okay, then it's, so that's a permutation. Okay. okay. And, and one way to try to remember that... is by the formulas. So that's the formula for the number of R permutations on N objects. This is the formula for the number of combinations. And this is a smaller number, right? It's a smaller number because we're taking the number of permutations and dividing by this, this factor right here. So this is smaller. And if you think about, you know, arranging things where you care about the order or you don't care about the order, the ones where you don't care about the order, there's fewer choices to make. Right? If you're trying to pick ten flowers out of a flower shop, you can just grab ten flowers and you're done. That's an unordered combination. If you're trying to arrange those ten flowers side by side in a certain way, that's, that's, that's more possibilities, right? So you're going to get a bigger number. That's, that's the ordered permutations. So you can kind of do combinations either using the sum rule or using this rule. Yeah, so so product rule. Or product rule, excuse me. Yeah, product rule. rule is really where this thing comes from. Um, 
and I don't know if product rule comes out directly for um, for unordered. So if you're trying to pick three people out of ten, right, the product rule would say we can pick ten people for the first one, we can pick nine for the second, we pick eight for the third. But that's that's inherently ordered. Because, you know, if I pick person A and then person B and then person C, that should be, if, if I don't care about the order, this would be the same as if I picked person C, person B, person A. And when we use the product rule, we're really, we're really thinking of the sequence of tasks. And, and so we're, we're getting a permutation rather than a combination. All right, so just, just a few specifics on the actual question. So um, 2.1.3, I guess I'll bring up the text here. And I looked, I looked at a sampling of problems from each section. I didn't grade every single question. and I didn't grade 2.3.7 that we actually went over in class. Um, but 2.1.3, um, shirt comes in four sizes, six colors, and three emblems. So you can have a dragon, alligator, or no emblem on the pocket. So effectively three emblem choices. Um, and they want to know how many shirts are possible. Well, it's, it's four ways that you can do the first task which is choosing um, the size and then six ways to do the second task which is choosing the color and three ways to choose the emblem to straight product rules 72 possible shirts question five is the same with a little bit of a red herring in here so um, you want to take a picture of six officers there'll be two rows of three people how many ways can the officers be arranged well the red herring is, you know, the fact that they're in two rows really has no bearing on, on the problem. The, the, other than the fact that, you know, there's a way we can think of, you know, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth person. There's an order here. Um, but, you know, the question is no different from if you were putting six people in a line like this or putting them in a bowling pin pattern. Um, it doesn't affect your answer. Right, the number of arrangements you can make is really just how many ways can I arrange six people. And so we can do a product rule, six places we can put the first person. And once we put the first person in a spot, there's five places for the second. And then four, three, two, one, that's just six factorial, 720. If we just think of this in terms of permutations, we've got six people and we're trying to choose six of them and arrange them. How many ordered combinations are there? It's just P6. That would be six factorial over six minus six factorial. And so again, you end up with just six factorial. All right, and then the question from there that I graded was, was um, 15. And it's, it's no different from the others. You're having dinner, you can have fish, lamb, or beef. No veggie options, boo. Um, choice of peas or carrots for a vegetable, and choice of pie cake or ice cream for dessert. And you must have one item from each category. If you don't eat your meat, you don't get any pudding. So um, it's another product rule, right? Three ways that you can choose the main course, two ways you can choose the vegetable, and three ways you can choose the dessert. So that's just three times two times three. Leaves you with a total of 18 possible dinners. Of course you did. <laughs> so I've probably seen the wall well over a hundred times. My, uh, my senior year as an undergrad we had it running on a continuous tape loop in the um, the lab where I hung out with my friends. And so I probably watched it, you know, four or five times a day, depending on how much coding was going on. So um, a lot of code I wrote my senior year has wall lyrics in it, for example. It's an interesting way to live. Um, all right, so um, 2.2, I looked at question one, so... 
a raffle with um, three different prizes and a thousand raffle tickets. And I never realized until this this quarter that there's some ambiguity in here, actually. There's some assumptions that are kind of being made, but not explicitly. So the way you would normally think about this, or the way you're supposed to think about this, I believe, is, um, you know, a thousand raffle tickets. How many different ways can those, those tickets be um, selected, right? And so... Um, Three different prizes means that, you know, the first ticket that you draw is going to win the first prize, the second draws, wins the second, the third wins the third, and that's a different outcome from, um, you know, if you draw that third ticket first, right? So this is, this is definitely an ordered arrangement, and I think the, the way they're intending you to do this is, you know, how many different tickets could... Um, end up being the one that wins the first draw. There's a thousand of those, and then there's 999 of the next one, and 998 of the second one, of the third one, which is also P1000, comma three ordered arrangements of three things taken from a thousand tickets. Um, but I had one person who who interpreted this as. Um, looking at um, what if somebody buys multiple tickets, right? What if one person buys three tickets and and they end up winning all three of the draws, right? That would be the same outcome as, you know, whichever order you drew them in. Um, but then I thought, you know, if, if one person buys a thousand raffle tickets, there's only one way the prize can be distributed, which is that one person gets first, second, and third prize. And so, so it gets much more complex if you think about this in terms of assigning these tickets to people with possible multiplicities and then asking, you know, how many different ways can people go home at the end of, of the raffle drawing. And I don't think there's an easy way to do that. I think it, it gets much more complex and you have to specify a lot of details. So I think the intent here was just looking at the tickets themselves. And um, how many different ways um, tickets, you know, could end up being the winning ticket. And so it's just P1003. So a big number. All right. And then we talked a little bit last week, about, or uh, Monday, about question three. So 26 letters in the alphabet. Um, how many eight-letter words can be formed? And so um, on this one... Thank you. It's it's not a question of ordered versus unordered, right? We we always care about word order, except for palindromes. We always care about the order of letters in words. Um, it's still a permutation question of some sort. But the two interpretations for this are basically, do we have duplicates or not? So if we just think of, you know, let's take the letters... Um, a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And let's, let's just rearrange those in different ways, or, you know, all of these. Let's just take eight of these and make a word, right? That's 26, comma, H. Number of eight permutations of 26 objects. And so this would be like if these were little Scrabble letters and you had 26 letters to choose from how many words could you make and this would be your answer but if we're just thinking of you know writing down an eight letter word comprised of these symbols then there's 26 options for the first letter 26 for the second 26 for the third and a total of 26 to the eighth possible words so those would be your two answers there All right, and then I looked at question seven also. This is still 2.2. Um, question seven, which we also talked about the other day. So, um, trying to fill five positions on a basketball team, and you have 15 players to choose from. And in the first part, any player can go to any position. So this is, this is another product rule. Where we say we can take, um, we can decide who to put in the first position, 
and there's 15 ways to do that. And then we've got 14 players left. We can choose any of them for the second position, and so on. And so this is P15, comma 5. But then in the second part, it says, suppose that the center, which is one of the positions, can only be filled by one of two people. So one way to do this is, is to write out a product rule and say, hey, okay, let's fill the center. There's two ways to do that. And so we'll pick one of those two players to be the center. And now we've got 14 players left to fill the next position and then 13 and 12 and 11. And so that would be a form of your answer. But we can also think of this as a product rule in a different sense, we can think of two tasks. Task one, figure out who's going to play center. And the number of ways we can do that is we have two people and we have to choose one of them. And then task two is fill in the other four positions. We've got 14 players left, so we have P14, comma 4. And the succession of those two tasks gives us the team, so this is a product rule, and the answer would just be this times that, which, if you write it out, turns out to be exactly that. So yeah, that's, that's a fun and tricky one. And then section 2.3... Um, I didn't I didn't grade one from here, but we talked about about question seven last time and that was principle of inclusion exclusion um, And so 47 plus 42 is the sum of the two sizes of the sets we take away 17 for the intersection and that leaves us I think 72 um, Participants in the union of these two sets and so if there's a total of 90 people Take the difference, that's 18 people didn't participate in either activity. And then section 2.4, um, I looked at questions 1 and 3. So question 1 was um, this Judiciary Committee, and it's made up of three faculty members and four students, chosen from 10 faculty and 25 students. And I guess it's an unspoken assumption in here that the order in which you pick these these faculty members or students doesn't affect the, the makeup of the committee. It should probably say, you know, uh, judiciary committee made up of identical positions or something like that. But it's in the unit on combinations, right? So, so pretty safe bet that we're looking at unordered arrangements here. So, and this is, this is also a product rule, right? We have two tasks. First task, choose the faculty members. Second task, choose the student members. So to choose the faculty members, we have to pick 10 faculty members out of, sorry, we have to pick three faculty out of a group of 10. And so that's just 10 choose three. And then we have to pick a total of four students out of 25. So that's 25 choose 4. And to form the committee, we have to do both of these tasks so we can use a product rule. And that would, that would give you your answer. And again, if you write this, right, or you write C 10 comma 3 times C 25 4, then it's really clear, you know, you've got the connection between what the problem's asking and, and these, these different ways of, of counting. And then, you know, you can go ahead and you can do this. And then you can go ahead and you can start canceling things out and so on and, and get down to a number. But there's so much that can go wrong here. And if on a test we just did the, you know, 10 choose 3 times 25 choose 4 and stop there, would that be good enough? I would still bring it down to this. Just to show we know what, what that... Yeah, just to is. show that you know the formulas. Which shouldn't be a big deal. I mean, you've got, you've got answers, you've got uh, note sheets with you and so on, so it's really just copying from your note sheet, but it's just, it's just nice to, you know, see it right there. Um, 
as something that you could then calculate with a calculator or with pencil and paper or whatever. But if you don't have a calculator, I wouldn't spend a lot of time going any further than this. Unless the problem says, you know, make sure you use an exact number for your answer. Which I won't do. At least not for something like this. Those are exact answers. Those are exact answers. This is true. <laughs> um, so how many subsets of, of the numbers 1 through 10 contain at least 7 elements? Um, so taking subsets... If you want to make a subset of seven elements, you basically have to choose seven of these ten things. And there's no order to a set. So if I choose one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I'm going to get a subset that's exactly the same as if I choose two, four, six, seven, one, three, five. Or if I choose seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. I end up with the same subset. So. Um, the number of subsets I can form is the number of unordered arrangements of seven objects taken from these ten. That's the number of seven element subsets. But the question says um, how many subsets contain at least seven elements. So I can, I can form such a subset by doing one of the following tasks. Either form an element containing a subset containing seven elements or form a subset containing eight elements, or a subset containing nine, or a subset containing ten. And since I'm going to do one of those, this is a sum rule, so I add up those numbers, and that gives me my final count. All right, and I didn't grade um, question 13, but question 13, I think, is a really fun question because um, it's geometric, right? You've got n points on a plane, um, and no three are on the same line, so you don't have collinear points. Um, and how many lines are determined by the points? So, in other words, if, if you put five lines down, five points down. I shouldn't have put that one there. Put five points down where you don't have three of them laying in the same line, right? How many different lines can we draw? I think, I think that's it. Um, yeah, so how, how do you do this? 10 choose 2. Because for a line order, it doesn't matter. Yeah, or so if you want to draw a line, all you have to do is pick two points. That gives you a line. And if you have a line, it's determined by the two points that it, that it passes through. And the order of the lines doesn't matter. So the number of ways you can pick two things from n, that's the number of lines you can draw. And if these were were vectors, if they were directed lines, that would look like this. That would be the number of ordered arrangements of two things from n. And guess what? You know, this is n factorial over n minus 2 factorial. This is n factorial over n minus 2 factorial times 2 factorial. This is half of that, and that is twice this. And that, that should make logical sense, right? If I can draw 100 lines, the number of lines I can draw with directions to them would just be 200, because for every line I got one going like that, and I got one going like that. Right, so that's that's another way to look at the idea that this part of the combination formula is factoring out the duplicates. And then the other part of that, part B, is the same question except how many triangles are determined. And to draw a, a triangle, all you have to do is pick three points. And so that's just going to be n choose three. 
So that's kind of a neat geometric interpretation of, of these choice functions. Did anybody look at question 17? That's a fun little problem. 9,998 cubed. Well, that's a bit of work to, to multiply out by hand. Because these are big digits, right? And you have to do lots of, of large multiplying. You're going to end up with a bunch of stuff you have to add together. But with a the binomial theorem, we can write this as you know, some expression involving these two terms, 10,000 and 2. And it's going to be 10,000 cubed minus 10,000 squared times 2 plus 10,000 times 4 minus 8. Now you've got just a few numbers we have to deal with. I didn't even notice that one, but now that I see it, I'm like, oh yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, it's kind of kind of tricky. All right, so any any uh, questions on the homework? Let's go back to graph theory. And um, we finished Wednesday talking about, well, we did a lot of definitions and we did some examples. And we finished talking about operations you could do on a graph, removing edges, removing vertices, contracting an edge, and so on and so forth. And so I want to look at what we can do with all of this if we want to work with graphs in a computer if you want to store this information because the way the graph is drawn on paper is not particularly relevant and what I call these these vertices is not relevant um, but there's there's some aspect of this which is unchanged unchanging no matter how I draw my graph so if I if I did something like e goes to a goes to B goes to D goes to C and C goes over to B and I think that's the same graph So the main thing we're interested in is what are the sets of vertices and how are they connected to each other? And so so one way we can represent this is is what's called an adjacency list. And so for an adjacency list, we list each of the vertices and next to each one, we just make a list of the vertices connected to it. So for example, A is connected to B and E. B is connected to A, C, and D, right? A, C, and D. C is connected to B and D. D is connected to B and C. And E is connected to A. And that captures exactly the same information that's in this picture. And nothing more. It doesn't capture the fact that, you know, I drew EA and AB at 90 degrees to each other and so on and so forth. And that's not part of the graph. So it really just captures the connectivity from vertex to vertex. And so this is an adjacency list. And we might have, you know, an array in C, 
of five elements where each element stored, you know, the name of the vertex. And we might have a parallel array of, you know, connected uh, vertices, and that would be an array of arrays. And so the first array in that array would contain, you know, a B and an E, and the second array would contain A, C, D, and so on. As soon as we start 222, we're going to talk about what's called a linked list. And if we were trying to implement this in a computer, we might use a linked list. And we would say, you know, A is something that points to something that contains a B, and that points to something containing an E, and so on. And so we could store our information in the memory of a computer like this. And that's a, a very easy thing to construct, but not necessarily the most useful thing to use. So if I want to know if there's any cycles in here, I could start with A, and I could say, well, A goes to B. And if I look at B, I can say, well, B goes to A, but I'm not interested in that. But B also goes to C, and C could go to B, but I'm not interested in that. And it would take a lot of, of sort of processing and bookkeeping to eventually get to the fact that B will take me to C, which will take me to D, which will bring me back to B. And so I actually do have a loop here. But this is, this is one way to store, um, store a graph. And we'll use that sometime, but probably the most common way that we'll encounter is an adjacency matrix. And this is potentially a lot less space efficient, but easier to sort of understand and work with maybe. And so this is just a two dimensional array or a matrix. And we just store ones and zeros here to say two vertices are connected or not connected. So for example, A is not connected to itself, but A is connected to B. It's not directly connected to C or D, but it is connected to E. And for, for an undirected graph where I just either have an edge or I don't have an edge, I could also come down this first column and say A is connected to B, it's not connected to C or D, it's connected to E. Alright, B is connected to A and C and D. So that's what the row and column for B look like. C is connected to B and D. So C is connected to D. D is connected to B and C, and E is connected to A, which it's already noted. And so there's an adjacency matrix for this graph. If there was a loop that just connected A to A, would the adjacency matrix get a 1 in the... So you'd have a 1 right here, for example, if A was connected to A. Okay. So it is possible. Definitely, yeah. Okay. And the fact that I have 0 on the diagonals means that there's no spots where a vertex is connected to itself. And if you look down this diagonal, the matrix is symmetric, right? The first row and the first column are the same. The third row, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and the third column, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, are the same. And that's always going to be the case with an undirected graph because if I have an edge from B to C, I've got an edge from C to B. Well, B to C would go right here, C to B would go right here. And so one thing we can do quickly with an adjacency matrix is we can calculate the degree of each vertex. So if I were to just add up each row, this is a 2, this is a 3, this is 2, 2, and 1. Well, that corresponds to the degree of each vertex. 
the reason that A has degree 2 is because there's two edges coming out of it, which is happening because there's two vertices connected to it, which reflects the fact that there's two elements in that first row that are equal to 1. So that's an adjacency matrix. And one of the nice things about adjacency matrices is that um, you can do things, for example, to uh, represent a weighted graph. So if I wanted to have not just the fact that there's a connection between A and B, but I wanted to put a weight on it, like this is a weight of 2, I can represent that by in here putting in the weight. So instead of just making this binary edge or no edge, we could actually put in the weight of each edge with the understanding that a zero means there's no edge. And we could have negative weights as well. We could put negative numbers in there. And if we have a directed graph, we could think of this as saying, you know, the row is going to tell you what vertex we're coming from and the column is going to be what vertex we're going to. And so if I had an edge from A to C, I would put a 1 right here. But I would not put a 1 here unless I also had an edge from C to A. So now I can represent directed graphs as well as undirected. Um, you could use something like a hash table to represent this. Um, that could be useful, especially for an adjacency list, maybe, um, where you wanted to to go in with the name of a vertex and pull out, um, you know, a list of all the vertices associated with it. Um, assuming your vertices were not, you know, just sequential integers or something like that. So yeah, that could be a good application of a hash. We were talking hashes in, in 224, so if you're not in 224, and you don't know what a hash is, don't worry about it. It's a super duper array. All right, so that's an adjacency matrix. Um, there's another form we can use, and we don't encounter this one very often, um, but this is called an incidence matrix. And remember, we can, we can talk about... Um, an edge being incident to a vertex, meaning the edge is connected to it. Um, so an incidence matrix. And so, so we could set this up by, for example, listing our vertices. As rows. And we would we would label our edges. So I don't know what I'm, what I'm going to call these. I'm going to call it uh, Z, Y, X, W, V. And I happen to have five edges as well as five vertices. So I'll list my edges over here: V, W, X, Y, and Z. And now I'm going to say, um, let's list whether each edge is incident to each vertex. So what are the edges incident to A? Well, it's just Y and Z. So I'll put ones here and zeros everywhere else. The edges incident to B would be V, X, and Y. So V, X, and Y. And then zero on the others. The edges incident to C would be X and W. So we'd have W and X. For D, we've got two edges incident to it, V and W. And for E, we have a single edge incident to it, which is Z. And there you go, there's an incidence matrix for this graph.
making my tower of sunlight blocking. Make a thingy? kind of worked okay good enough um all right so any questions about that so one thing we can do with these representations is we can start to look at this question of when are two graphs the same and you know if we draw these graphs on paper they can look very different to us but they might end up being the same so um So we can talk about two graphs being isomorphic to each other or having the same form. And so two graphs, let me call them G1 with the vertices V1, E1, and G2 with the vertices V2, edges E2 are isomorphic. isomorphic to each other, but we can just say they're isomorphic. If there exists a bijection F going from V1 to V2 such that, we'll explain this in plain English in a minute, such that um, A comma B um, are adjacent in G1 if and only if F of A, F of B are adjacent in G2. All right, what, is, what does that mean? Um, vertices, edges, vertices, edges. Right? So, so here's A, B, C, D. And there's a graph. Here's W, X, Y, Z. And here's a graph. And these turn out to be isomorphic to each other. They're exactly the same graph. The reason that they're the same graph is because we can find a function which maps this set to this set and that function has the following properties first of all it's bijective which means it's injective and surjective which means everything over here is mapped to from something over here and two different things here will map to different things over there so it's a one-to-one -one correspondence between vertices here and vertices there so we're basically able to take these vertices and rename them to W, X, Y, Z and end up with a graph where if these two things are adjacent, then the two vertices that we mapped W and X from were adjacent over here. In other words, we can rename the vertices here to these vertices in such a way that adjacency is preserved. So for us, we could find an isomorphism by saying f of a equals w, f of b equals x, f of c equals uh, z, and f of d equals y. And we can check to see if that's really an isomorphism. Well, for example, a and c are adjacent over here. 
f of a is w f of c is z so w and z better be adjacent over here while they are and b and d were adjacent in the original graph g1 and so x and y should be adjacent in graph g2 and they are and we can do this for every pair of vertices in this graph that are adjacent, we should find that the corresponding vertices in this graph are adjacent, and vice versa. It's an if and only if. And sometimes you see isomorphism written like that. It's an equal sign with a twiddle on top. And this is a hard problem, computationally. It's, it's trivial to write a program to confirm whether two graphs are isomorphic. You just try all possible functions. And we can enumerate all the possible functions from this set of vertices to that set of vertices. We could count them using, you know, some uh, counting rule that we've already learned. And we could make a series of nested for loops, maybe, and go through all possible mappings. And for each one, just check each adjacency over here and see if you get an adjacency over there. But time-wise, it's, it's prohibitive. If you had a graph with 100 nodes, this would take an a insane amount of time to try all the possible mappings. So in general, to tell if two graphs are isomorphic, difficult problem. In some particular cases, we might see something, and we can come up with a function, and then we can confirm pretty easily, yeah, that's an isomorphism. So these are the same graph. But intuitively, think about this as, you know, these lines are rubber bands and these vertices are push pins that you're putting in a bulletin board. And take your push pins A, B, C, and D and connect them, you know, with rubber bands so that you get this graph on your bulletin board. And now what you want to do is by, by not breaking any of the connections that, that are the rubber bands. You want to just move these vertices around so that your graph looks like this. And in this case, you know, I'd pull out these two pins C and D and I'd just swap them with each other. And now these two rubber bands would cross over and I'd have this shape. And then I could say, okay, so this is, you know, W, X, Y, Z. Any questions about that concept-wise? A lot of a lot of mathematics studies isomorphisms. Um, there's a branch called uh, topology, branch of mathematics, and a large part of of that is the study of isomorphisms um, or homeomorphisms. But you know, trying to recognize when two things are the same in some in some very precise sense. Um, that's a lot of what mathematics is about. I think it's a nod to our uh, very human desire to categorize and you know, put things into baskets and say, these are all the same, these are different. And so a lot of mathematics has developed around that kind of operation. And it's a hard question to take two graphs and, and say for certain whether or not they're isomorphic, but sometimes it's easy to know when two graphs are not isomorphic. That's not the same as being able to say that things are the same, but sometimes you can tell when they're not the same. And so we can, we can talk about what are called graph invariants. And an invariant is something that, that doesn't change. It's not, it's not varying, right? And so, so a really simple example of a graph invariant is number of vertices. And if I have a graph, you know, with 15 push pins, 15 vertices, and I'm not going to break any of the rubber bands or change any of the connections from pin to pin, but I'm just going to pick those pins up and move them around, there's no way I'm going to end up with a graph with 16 push pins. There's no way I'm going to end up with a graph with only 14 push pins unless, you know, my rabbit jumps up on my shoulder and steals a push pin. So I'm always going to end up with the same number of vertices. And so we can think of this as an invariant. 
And so if you're given a graph like this, and you're given a graph like this, you can just count the number of vertices and say these cannot be isomorphic. There's no way I can rearrange these four vertices and end up with this graph with five vertices. So that's an example of an invariant. Same thing with the number of edges. Because that's the number of rubber bands you have and you're not breaking rubber bands. So even if I have a, a fifth node here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six edges. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven edges here. These cannot be the same graph. So when we're talking about graphs that have direction, directional graphs, mm -hmm. and would we always draw the, if we had, you know, so on our undirected graph, we can go both directions on one edge. Mm -hmm. On a direct graph, do we always draw both directions? Independently of each other. Yeah. So, so, everything so everything has direction. Yeah. So if it's a directed graph, we need to show the direction of each vertex. And you may find, you know, shortcuts where, you know, you might find a graph, and if there's no arrowhead on here, it's understood that it goes in both directions. And that might make sense in a, a graph where most of your edges are bidirectional. But um, you know, you might see something like this. That's a little casual um, the most proper way would be to actually show two edges one going in each direction and the only issue with this is if you try to do something like count edges you gotta you gotta look for this and and you know count it twice whereas here you can just count the number of lines between dots but um, but yeah you'd need to do something or have some understanding as to to what the uh, the direction is So, um, a graph can be equivalent in the number of vertices, but not in the number of edges, and mm -hmm. vice versa as well. Yeah, and they would they would not be isomorphic if either of these is different. But you know, here's a graph with with three vertices and three edges. Here's a graph with. Um, with three vertices and two edges. Here's a graph with a single vertex, but three edges, or maybe six. So it's only isomorphic if both of those conditions are met. That's, that's a minimum requirement, but that's not sufficient. And, and a sort of easy example of that would be well let's see uh, four and five I'm not gonna be able to do this off the top of my head because that's the same as that. Um, but but we will probably get to examples where we have the same number of edges and the same number of vertices, but the graphs are still not isomorphic. Um, so in that case, that last one where you drew a second, it's an undirected graph, but there's two vertices, or two edges connecting the same vertices. We don't remove redundancies, those stay? Um, it, it depends what you're trying to do. So if, if you're looking for an, an acquaintance graph, you want to know who, who, is, who has been introduced to who, right? If somebody has been introduced five times to somebody, you might not care. You just want to know have they been introduced or not. But if this is a network graph showing how many different um, fiber optic lines connect two machines together, you might very much care about, you know, how many edges there are. Or I care that there's two rows at the same place. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, it might be something that you would choose to represent with a weight, where you, you would have a single edge, but you would put a weight on it and say, you know, there's there's five um five different ways that this person knows that person. Right? Or they've been introduced five times or something like that. So like a real life weight might be 
over the internet, you have 128 megabytes up and down bandwidth between two nodes, right? Mm hmm That would be real like, wait, okay. Yeah, so you could make a, a network graph and you could list um, bandwidth or speed or something like that as, as the weight of each edge. And then, you know, you might find that, that you've got some machine here and some machine here and you're connected on, you know, a 12 kilobit per second um, communication path because it's using signal flags and Lego toys and you might find that you know there's there's a path from A to B that goes along this route and these might be you know very fast communication channels or have a higher bandwidth higher carrying capacity and so on this is how those neural networks um, operate right yeah, you can, I mean, neural network is, is in some way, parts of it is in some ways a subset of, of graph theory. It certainly employs graph theory. Um, and you can think of, you know, a neural network as a series of neurons with different connections to nodes. And those, we, we generally have weights associated with them. And then there's some function performed in here that takes your incoming signals scales them according to a weight looks for a threshold and then potentially fires an output to the next level and that's something we've been doing for you know probably half a century now it's just that google's got enough horsepower now they can do it really really fast and so we start to see these emergent properties that you know let me go to google and say hey what was that movie with the uh the one-armed banker who ends up falling in love with the movie star and it'll come out and it'll tell me the title, you know. Um, that's just because it's really fast. Alright, so another thing we're interested in with graphs is paths, right? How do we get from one point to another in a graph? Um, and there's, there's different types of, of paths we can think about. Um, So here's, here's a graph, it's got five vertices and looks like eight edges, so several edges. Um, and, and we can ask questions about traveling along this graph. And so um, let me define a simple path. And a simple path... Um, only travels along an edge once. So a simple path from here to here might be, you know, go from here, go up there, come up there. Another simple path might be go from here to here, over to here, and up to the top. A third simple path might be, you know, come up here, go over this way, come down, come back up this edge, and then go to the top. Those are all simple paths because I haven't traveled along any edge more than once. A non-simple path would be, you know, start here and let's go around this square a few times, and then let's go up to the top. Well, as soon as I repeat an edge more than once, it's no longer simple. And so there's, there's a particular type of path that um, we call an Euler path. So an Euler path is, um, is simple and also travels along every edge. So it travels along every edge, and since it's simple, we can't travel along an edge more than once. So an Euler path is basically a path that travels along every edge exactly once. <clears throat> I believe it's Euler, yeah. Although it looks like Euler. I haven't checked that in a long time. Euler. 
There we go. Euler. Euler. All right, we got it from the Oracle. All right, so um, an Euler path is is a path that goes through the graph and, and travels along each edge exactly once. And so we can ask, for example, for this graph, is there an Euler path? Is there some way we can travel along these edges? And, and when we talk about following a path, I didn't say it, but, but um, you know, if, if we travel along this edge from this vertex to this vertex, the next edge we travel along has to start at this vertex. We can't just travel along here and then teleport over to here and come along this and then teleport up to here, right? So we're going from, from one edge to another in sort of the canonical way. So is there a way to, to travel through this graph and, and go along each edge exactly once? So try that for a minute. We have a yes. So one way to to do this, if the answer is yes, is you should be able to draw this shape without lifting your pen and without drawing over a line more than once. Or if you have a bendy straw, you should be able to bend it into this shape. So so I can start down here and I can go like this. And there we go. So I started here, I ended here, and I drew my shape and I never had to go over an edge more than once. So that's an Euler path. And you notice that I started and ended at different vertices. So we can also talk about an Euler circuit. And this is an Euler path, but we also start and end at the same vertex. And it turns out there's no Euler, Euler circuit through this shape. But let's let's look at some different shapes, some different graphs. So this one I could I could begin down here. I could come across, go up here, continue going up, go across, come down, come down, and I've managed to draw not only an Euler path, but an Euler circuit. Because I started and ended at the same point. Here's a different graph. It's a box with a circle in the middle, so we call this a wheel. This would be W4. And for this one, there's no Euler path and there's no Euler circuit. For this graph, I could start up here, and I could come over, down here, come back here, come back here, come up here, come down this way, and go up there, and there I go, I've completed the shape. So that has an Euler path, but no Euler circuit. <coughs> if it has a circuit, then it definitely has a path, because, you know, an Euler circuit is an Euler path, but even if it has a path, it may or may not have a circuit. And so Euler, mathematician, 
1700s, I think, maybe 1800s, um, studied these and, and um, is credited with a theorem about when you have an Euler path or you have an Euler circuit. And the theorem is related to the degree of each vertex in your graph. And so if, if we look at the degree of each of our vertices, remember the degree is the total number of edges connected to a vertex. So these have degree 2, and this has degree 4. In this, this second graph, these have degree 3, and the middle vertex has degree 4. And on this graph on the end, this has degree 3, 2, um, 4, 3, and 2. So the theorem is a graph has an Euler circuit if and only if um, every vertex has even degree. So if every vertex has an even degree, you will have an Euler circuit. If any vertices have odd degree, you won't have a circuit. And there's, there's a second version of this if exactly two vertices have odd degree. then you have an Euler path. And so in this case we had two vertices with odd degree and all the other degrees were even so this has an Euler path. But since not all the vertices have even degree it does not have an Euler circuit. And if you want to actually find the Euler path it's fairly straightforward at least for simple graphs provided you start at the vertex with the odd degree, one of the vertices with the odd degree, and you understand that you're going to end at the other vertex with the odd degree. And this is, this is not terribly mysterious. If you think about what you're doing when you start from some point and you start trying to draw a graph without lifting your pen, well, the first line I'm going to come away from here with is going to leave this with an odd degree. It's got a degree of 1 so far. And if I encounter a vertex and I'm not done, I'm going to leave that vertex. When I hit this vertex, the degree went up by 1. When I left, the degree went up by another 1. So the degree changed by 2. And until I've drawn a line through my vertices, those vertices have degree 0. So any time I encounter a vertex and leave it, the degree goes up by 2, it remains even. And now if I come down here and I hit this vertex, the degree goes up by 1, and when I make an edge coming out of it, the degree changes by 2. And if I encounter a node that's already been encountered, the degree goes up by 1, when I leave it goes up by 2, it doesn't change whether it's even or odd. The vertex I started with, which I said was going to be one of the vertices with an odd degree, well, it's got an odd degree because I left, and if I encounter that again, it will go up by 1, 2. An odd number plus 2 is still odd. And so I'll encounter this vertex and leave it. And the vertex that I end on, I'm going to basically draw an edge into it but not come out. So if that's my ending vertex, that's got degree 1. If I leave that, right, that's got degree 2. Whatever vertex I end on, right, it's currently going to have an even degree, and so I'm going to add one more to its degree by coming in, but if I don't leave again, that's going to end up with an odd degree. So if that's the last, vert last edge I had to draw, right, there's my two nodes with odd degree. And if I have an Euler circuit, I'll leave that, that goes back to an even degree, and I have to end where I started. Well, the node I started on has an odd degree right now. I'm going to draw one more edge into it which makes that thing have degree that's even, and if that's the last edge I had to draw, you know, every vertex has an even degree. 
so that's that's sort of the mindset I think behind you know realizing this this theorem and trying to to work towards a proof and you could probably do an induction on on the number of vertices or maybe the number of edges um, and use mathematical induction to um, to formalize this but that's that's kind of the spirit of what's going on All right, a uh, piece of terminology that'll be useful next quarter in CSC 222. Uh, connected graphs. This is a super simple concept. This is a graph. Right, it looks like two graphs, but it's still a graph, right? It's a collection of, of vertices and edges. There's at least one vertex, um, but it's a funny-looking graph. It looks like it's in two pieces, right? And the way we can sort of formally state that this is in two pieces is, for example, there's a vertex here and a vertex here, and there's no path between that vertex and that vertex. That's enough to say this is not a connected graph. And I can start from here and I can try to follow any path I want and I can go over edges twice and so on and so forth. But no matter what I do, I'm never going to end up over here. All right, so that's a, a disconnected graph. We don't deal with these very much. Um, and when we talk about trees and in data structures, we'll be dealing with connected graphs. Um, and that'll be important. All right, let's talk about um, Hamilton paths. So an Euler path is a path that, um, that travels along every edge of a graph. A Hamilton path travels along every vertex. So for example, Same example as last time. A Hamilton path would say, hey, there's a way to start from some vertex and find a simple path that visits every vertex. And this is easier than a Hamilton, than an Euler path, right? I could start here, come along here, go up here, come here, go there, I'm done. I've hit all five vertices. That's a Hamilton path. I, uh, I saw this guy write a program that tries to you know, beat Snake as fast as possible. <laughs> yeah. And he went over Hamiltonian paths a lot. Awesome. <laughs> That's cool. So that has a Hamiltonian path, and there's also Hamilton circuits, which is where you start and end at the same vertex. And in fact, if I start here, I can go to this vertex, this one, this one, this one. Then I can come down here and come back. And that's still a simple path that's visited every, every vertex. And I ended up where I started. So that's, that's a, uh, a Hamilton circuit. Here's another graph. And pretty easy to visit every vertex exactly once. I can start here, come down here, go like this, go like that. That's a Hamilton path. There's no Hamilton circuit for this. And you can kind of see why that is, because if I start here, there's no way I can get back to this vertex. Right? There's, there's no way, because the only way I can leave this vertex is along this edge. And for a simple path, I'm not allowed to travel along that edge again. So once I leave, I'm never going to get back there. And if I don't start here... If I start at some other vertex, eventually I need to come here. And once I get there, I'll have to have gone along this edge. There's no way to get back. And so if I'm starting from one of these vertices, once I visit this vertex, there's no way to get back to where I started. 
and so there's no Hamilton circuit. And here's a graph that has no Hamilton path and no Hamilton circuit. And it's kind of the same setup. If I start here, I can visit one of these two vertices, but I can never leave. Right? If it's a simple path, I'm only traveling along edges once. So if I decide to visit this vertex, I'm going to have to go along this edge and I'm stuck. I can't come back. If I decide to visit this vertex, I have to go along this edge and I'm stuck. And so there's no way, no matter how clever I am, that I can travel around this graph starting from here and end up visiting both of those vertices. And if I start on this vertex, same thing happens. If I start on this vertex, same thing happens. And if I start at any other vertex, I end up not being able to visit any of these three vertices and coming back. So I could visit one of them at the very end, but I'm left with two unvisited. And unlike Euler paths and Euler circuits, there's no general criteria we can use to look at a graph and know if there's a Hamilton path or a Hamilton circuit. There's just no, no matching uh, test we can apply. And so this is, this is a, a potentially complex problem computationally also. If you're given a graph with, you know, a thousand vertices and, I don't know, you know, several thousand edges, and you want to know, is there a way to travel through this graph so that we visit each vertex exactly once, or we travel along each edge exactly once? Um, in the case of an Euler path, we can at least be assured that it is possible. In the case of a Hamilton, we don't even know if it's possible or not. You would have to kind of exhaustively try, and that's, that's a pretty explosive problem combinationally. Depending on how much connectivity you have in your graph, because you start at one node and you, you travel to a second vertex and now you have, you know, all the edges connected to that as possible ways that you could go next. And for each of those choices of where to go next, you have, you know, a variety of choices where to go next from each of those vertices. And it's really not that hard to code if you've got, you know, the structure set up in place. It's really, it's a pretty simple recursive program but it ends up taking a lot of time. And so computationally, it's, it's very challenging. I think I missed it. Are we only allowed in Hamilton Path to visit the circuit or the, the node once? Um, so you're, you're only allowed to go through a vertex once. Uh, let's see, actually, I don't know if that's true. It's gotta be a simple path. Um, yeah, I think you have to travel to every vertex exactly once. Uh, which case, I don't know if this is actually a Hamilton circuit. Oh, but we could go like this. So there's a Hamilton circuit. All right, so uh, send me an attendance note on the way out. And um, Monday... I want to do two things. I want to give you an application of Hamilton um, circuits related to Engineering 250. And then I want to mainly look at the question of shortest paths. And so we're going to switch to looking at graphs that have weights associated with each edge. And we're going to look at the question of, suppose you're starting at one point, one vertex, and you're trying to get to another vertex. What's the shortest way that you can do that if each edge has some you know, distance associated with it. What would be a shortest path from one point to another? Where by shortest we mean if you add up all of those weights, you get the smallest number possible. And we're going to we're going to look at that question and see a solution called Dijkstra's algorithm. And I wanna I wanna describe that algorithm and then go through some examples of using it. And that's the last homework question on your current homework set is is to use Dijkstra's algorithm. To, um, to find the shortest path. 
So take a look at the homework before Monday, and if you have questions on any of the earlier questions, let me know, and we can talk about it in class. Um, and the last question, shortest paths, will go through Monday, the, um, the material we need for that. And that will do us for graph theory. Wednesday and Friday are holidays, and the next week will be, the week after that will be our last week, and we'll talk about um, grammars and um, automata theory. And that'll be the end of the, uh, the course. All right, so have a good weekend. Um, stay safe, and I will see you all on Monday. Have a great weekend. Thanks, you too. Hey, Nick, you were saying for our SLP, it's okay to use Unity to build like a game, right? Yeah, definitely. Because I'm thinking of switching up my design because I think Amazon for Alexa stuff, they have just too much resource.